Hello, everyone. Welcome to World Future Council's webinar on education for sustainable development, success factors in education, policy, and practice at UNESCO's World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development. My name is Kehtesha. I am the youngest counselor of World Future Council and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. Now, the sustainable development goals are the only viable and globally accepted roadmap that's available to us for rebuilding better from the throes of this pandemic that has wiped out and in many cases regressed much of the development achieved since 2015. And yet the greatest challenge is in localizing the SDGs within this decade that figuratively and literally is our last decade where any action we take will count as otherwise it may be too late to stop species loss or slow down global warming. So education for sustainable development provides us with the bridge through which the SDGs can travel to touch every human on our planet, including those who are the farthest and those who need it the most. We have no time to lose, and the quicker we use ESD as the tool of innovation, the faster and more resilient will be the recovery. We shall now see a short video to introduce the 12 key success factors in the handbook on ESD of World Future Council, and this will form the basis of today's discussion. Can we have the video, please? We identified 12 success factors for ESD in our handbook. The handbook, which you can find in the resources section of our booth, also explores a range of case studies from around the world that are showcasing how ESD can be effectively introduced in different contexts. If ESD policy and practice is going to succeed, it is crucial to generate and maintain political will and support from the national government and from stakeholders engaged in its implementation. This can be done, for example, by showcasing the scientific and academic evidence base in a language and with concepts that policymakers can relate to. ESD policies, laws, frameworks and mandates are important in providing institutional support which stakeholders need in order to implement ESD. Effective models include, for example, national ESD strategies and frameworks, ESD focal points, national coordinating bodies and interdepartmental committees. ESD partnerships can be instrumental at all stages of the policy cycle, helping to build coalitions and political will, assisting the drafting of legislation, and supporting delivery and monitoring progress. Whether through integration or redesign, the national curriculum often serves as the most significant piece of educational policy available to secure the implementation of ESD. Successful approaches include introducing adjectival learning approaches such as climate change or peace education, and using system-wide revisions that use ESD as a holistic, interdisciplinary and integrated concept around which the curriculum is developed. Progressive pedagogies that are active, transformative, learner-centered, participatory and connected to local communities and cultures are fundamental to the success of ESD. Such techniques include group discussions, problem-based learning, critical reading and writing, role-playing, outdoor field work, modeling, and case studies. Teachers can be powerful agents of sustainable progress and genuine transformation in society, and they play a key role in preparing students to become responsible citizens. They should be supported with both quality pre-service and in-service professional training to build the necessary knowledge and skills to deliver teaching and learning practices associated with ESD. The whole school approach offers a particularly promising mechanism for integrating ESD across an entire learning community. This includes wide-ranging improvements to curriculum, campus, institutional culture, student engagement, ecological footprint, learning outcomes and interactions with the wider community. Certification or recognition schemes can be another important lever for ESD implementation and can help schools embed ESD practices. Different countries and regions all have their unique challenges, local contexts, cultures and histories. All this richness and diversity affects the way ESD is perceived, adapted and implemented. 
ESD has a number of features that make evaluating its outcomes, effects and impacts challenging. Monitoring and assessment frameworks can help to ensure the ongoing relevance and effectiveness of ESD efforts, including by increasing understanding of progress and highlighting areas for improvement in ESD. Although it is clear that quality, inclusive and sustainable education is an investment with huge returns, it often suffers from inadequate funding. Efforts to close the funding gap must start with an increase in domestic funding to education. A significant increase in levels of development cooperation and donor funding for education is also needed, particularly to meet the requirements of low- and middle-income countries. To reach its full potential and continue to remain relevant beyond the years of formal education, ESD must forge deeper links with the world of work and the transition to sustainable economies and societies. ESD asks us to assume active roles in creating a world we'd be proud to pass on to our children and grandchildren. It motivates us to be good ancestors. But on that note, thank you for the video. We would like to invite our panelists to share their remarks introducing specific factors of the handbook based on examples on the ground. I would now like to invite Ralph Beherens, Hamburg Ministry of Environment, Climate, Energy and Agriculture, head of the ESD department. Now, Ralph, how does the Hamburg ESD master plan reflect factors one and three from political will for ESD policy and practice to multi-stakeholder collaborative ESD partnerships? So I'm, I'm, thank you for the presentation. I, I want to explain or uh, give you an example from Hamburg of a multi-stakeholder process to implement ESD on a local level, on a city level. And it's uh, the process is a collaboration of uh, public bodies, different ministries in Hamburg and uh, the civil society NGOs in Hamburg. And first of all, in 15 years ago already, we started uh, um, a network of ESD stakeholders in Hamburg. And we call it Hamburg is Learning Sustainability. The network is called like this. So it's a network of multi of, of stakeholders in Hamburg. And just uh, go to, to the gap to the global action program. One of the results in, uh, of, for Hamburg, one of the results of the gap program of the UNESCO was that we decided in Hamburg to develop a Hamburg strategy on ESD. We call it Hamburg Master Plan ESD 2030. And to, to show, first of all, we, we developed a logo, of course, and then we started the process, but to show you the, the, the timetable and the political process. In 2015, as I said, the GAP program started. And in the end, in September 15, we had a big stakeholder conference of the Hamburg as Learning Sustainability Group, the network. And there we decided that we want to have a, this strategy for Hamburg, an, an ESD strategy for all educational sectors. One year later, in August 2016, the Hamburg Parliament decided that we have to develop this strategy for Hamburg, the master plan ESD. And then we decided with the group of Hamburg is Learning Sustainability with the stakeholders, 140 stakeholders in Hamburg, we started the process, uh, uh, nearly three years process to develop the master plan. And then the idea was to start in 2020, last year. Uh, but the reality overtook us. So the Hamburg parliament didn't decide on our strategy, on our master plan in October 2019, so we couldn't start. And one reason was, I think this is uh, reality, there was an election in Hamburg. We wanted the decision in summer 19, at least yeah, at the latest October 19, but we couldn't get the, the decision because of money. And then in, in February 2020, there was an election in Hamburg, so they 
decided not to decide on a long-term strategy in Hamburg. And then next reality problem was Corona in Hamburg. So, and then the coalition negotiation in Hamburg of the two parties of the uh, Socialist and Green Party in Hamburg, they, it was late, six months later they decided, but they decided uh, to, to, uh, to start with our strategy, with our master plan. But then, next point, Corona again, second wave. Again, those Corona, so it is, uh, we, we are really suffering of the Corona reality. And of uh, Hamburg doesn't know how money uh, that doesn't know if they have money enough to finance our strategy. But this year we had a uh, turn, and now we are in the money negotiation, and we have a solution. And now we are really we in I think in six weeks we can start with our strategy. It's uh, one and a half two years late, but anyway. And in the end of the year, we want to celebrate it with a big uh, party kickoff. That's the idea. This slide is just to get an idea of all the NGOs that participated in our in the development of our strategy. And uh, to get a short conclusion, it's it's a master plan. The strategy is unique in Germany on a city level and a state level. Uh, the development was uh, started in 2017, finished in 19, 139 participants, 49 public institutions and 90 NGOs participate, participated. We wanted to start in 2020, we start this year, we want to finish in 2030. And our master plan, our strategy includes all educational sectors from early childhood, school, vocational, education, higher education and non-formal, so that's the idea, the whole package for Hamburg. And it has about 100 actions. And uh, in, in 2030, we will be in the ESD sky. Thank you. It was a short overview from Hamburg. Amazing. Thank you very much, Ralph, for sharing the work Ham the city of Hamburg is doing on ESD and in turn, urban sustainability. Now, I will be sharing the work of Green Hope Foundation on Factor 4 and on ESD. So, Green Hope Foundation is a global social innovation enterprise that works across 25 countries, impacting over 140,000 people, whose mission is to provide a platform of learning and ground level action to create a just, equitable, and sustainable future. And we use education for sustainable development as a transformative tool to engage and educate young people as well as all sectors of society to really create empathetic, responsible global citizens by localizing the sustainable development goals. Now, our work on ESD covers all 12 factors of WFC's handbook, but focusing on factor four, ESD curriculum revisions and integration practices, through our 300 plus sustainability academies globally and linked to factor nine, which is local culturally relevant place-based learning. Now Green Hope works in partnership with school boards and universities in multiple countries. In the UAE, we are partnered with Dubai's education board, engaging students in actions from stopping land degradation to mangrove planting, which is also expanded to Oman and Bahrain we were invited by the president's office in Suriname to continue our ESD engagement with their indigenous youth. And we are also partnered with their national youth parliament to take this forward. In Canada, where I'm from, we partner with several school boards, the largest of them being the Toronto District School Board, where Green Hope is providing environmental education to the children. In our workshops on educating the educator, we provide tools to teachers to bring sustainability education into their classrooms. Now, we work not only in urban areas with children who have formal education, but we focus specifically on children and youth from marginalized communities. So we have engaged Rohingya refugee children in Kutupalong, the world's largest refugee camp, children in the Syrian refugee camp on the Lebanon-Syria border, homes for children of prisoners in Kenya and Nepal, 
homes for HIV positive children in Nepal, orphanages, children on the streets in line with the SDGs mandate of leaving no one behind and ensuring a life of dignity for all. And since most of these children don't have access to formal education, no English, or even know how to read and write, we use non-formal methods of communication, such as music, art, dance, drama, sport, eco-fashion, and writing. And above all, we bring out the child in these young people, many of whom have forgotten to smile. We have distributed solar lamps to thousands across Nepal, Kenya, and India in the run of Kutch to ensure that the children are able to study at night. During this pandemic, we have conducted over 85 high-level webinars that also function as education toolkits, engaging leaders from the former president of Ireland, former prime ministers of Canada and Greece, UN officials, and civil society trailblazers. And we've, of course, also continued our sustainability academies, engaging with children from India to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Also during this pandemic, Green Hope has been working tirelessly to distribute sanitation kits and providing education to children in Bangladesh. We have installed deep bore tube wells in the villages there. We've built toilets. We've installed rainwater harvesting systems. And we are transforming the women into poultry farming entrepreneurs so that they can send their children, and especially their girls, to school. Our Grow Your Own Food campaign teaches children about eat eating locally grown organic food and making their own compost. And our project, Powering Education in Rural Liberia, is installing solar panels in homes, the school, and community center, as well as solar streetlights in a town previously without electricity, where we are now providing the girls with computer literacy education. Green Hope also works on peace and nuclear disarmament education. We do this by getting our voices heard at the United Nations. We've created digital toolkits on nuclear disarmament, composed peace songs, and our most impactful campaign now has the tagline, we want books, not nukes. This is Green Hope Foundation's call to action through education for sustainable development, we want to empower children and young people and bring them to the forefront of the change-making dialogue because it is our future that is at stake. And our lived experiences at Green Hope Foundation prove that the unique potency of both the SDGs and ESD is in their universality we have found it equally transformative, be it with climate refugees or advancing social equity in COVID impacted rural environments or addressing urban sustainability challenges. And this of course vindicates our belief that the route to Agenda 2030 is through education for sustainable development. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to invite our next speaker Patricia Combo from the Poultry Initiative. And Patricia, I'd like to ask you, how does your work relate to Factor Six teacher education training and resourcing? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, my name is Patricia Combo from Kenya and uh, with Patri Initiative, we've been working with schools to ensure we promote greening agenda and also ensuring that we incorporate ESD as a way of ensuring we attain sustainable development goals in Kenya. And our work involves partnering with schools and also training teachers on how they can foster activities like kitchen gardens and also tree nurseries. And I will be sharing factor six which is on teacher education training and resourcing yeah and the first of all the quality of education is dependent on teachers knowledge and also experience and how these are are communicated with Patri initiative we try as much as we can to engage the teachers to train them on some of basic approaches so that they get the wide knowledge and also they gain the experience so that when they will be advocating or rather passing the information to the young generation and students, first to ensure they pass the right education and also to ensure they pass quality education. And we believe that teachers are agents of change. And that's 
teachers need to be motivated and also need to be trained. This is one of the photos whereby we were training a third teacher on planting trees, the right growing trees in the right process, and also ensuring that we recycle the plastic. And we believe for us to ensure we move and integrate ESG in our curriculum, teachers or other educators need to, need to get an opportunity for both pre-service and in-service in learning, first to ensure they build knowledge, skills, and skills needed for values. We all know traditionally, a lot education system has been measuring on theory based, and now with integration to this competency based and skill based, a lot of training needs to be done first to ensure we make teachers to be confident when they are training the, the generation. And one of key areas that we are working on is ensuring that we have experience or rather the hands on experience. And in this, we focus the teacher as a learner. Anytime we visit a school, we take the teacher to be our learner, whereby we intend to equip him or her with the, the right knowledge, because if the teacher being a learner will, be, will motivate him when, we'll, when they will be advocating or rather training the kids, they will have confidence. And I will just say nothing beats and on experience. So teachers should experience for themselves and also get the the learning, the methods during training. Anytime we, our work resolves on setting up kitchen gardens and also to nurseries and growing. So we ensure in the process, in all that we do, we incorporate teachers, they are part of the model, they are part of the exercise, first to ensure they get on the first hand experience, which will later translate to the, to the kids. And I will I'll give you, I'll take you through a few features of education models first to ensure that the ESG really translate to young people. And we've, all, we've always been measuring on action-oriented, transformative, that engage innovation and creative thinking. And this is on the practices or rather the actions that we take. And also we are learning on basis of real societal challenges in the local context. First to ensure that teachers get experience and when they'll be training the learners, they will use local examples which, which learners can really resonate with. Then we have engagement with external partners and the non-formal education. With ESB, we realize it's not necessarily the, what is taught in class, but communities and also non-formal communities really shape the future of education. So in all what we do, we incorporate communities and we also, engage, we also have like community, tree planting days and also we bring them to be part of the process because we know they they influence policy and also they they kind of modify how the education system will be then finally we another feature is exploration of key principles of sustainable development in their local and national context and this is whereby we use the local examples examples and also we try to relate them with regional or rather national examples and and how teachers and students in other regions are doing. Uh, this is one of our tree planting exercise and the people in front are teachers. And these, we always work with teachers because we want first of all to empower them and also to increase their service, their skills as they continue training and also advancing with the technology first to ensure they remain relevant in delivering education to young people. We have in-service training and professional development, and this ensures that oh, sorry, this ensures that educator, educators are increasingly well trained and motivated to teach ESDs. And the reason why we in-service training is very crucial for teachers is because it gives them motivation. It helps teacher in like special or rather specialities and keeps them abreast with the latest knowledge, skills, and methodologies. Every time, every day, policies are being drafted, things are changing, and so it's to ensure that we keep our teachers to be as a part of what is happening locally and internationally. In-service training needs to be an advanced and enhanced, first to ensure that our teachers are not left behind. And so I'll give an example in, in Cyprus, that is, they have set a mandatory in-service training in 
sustainable development education for both principals and subject teachers and school-based seminars. This ensures through the seminars, the teachers are able to get more skills and also they are able to strengthen the knowledge that they already got in the pre-service training. Oh, this was another school whereby we partnered with community members to help us grow trees. And through this, you find the experience and the notion shared between the educators and the community keeps the strengthening the sustainable development goals and also equipping the learners with the required 21st century like confidence whereby they can communicate effectively and also issues to do with problem solving. Then we have the final one is on peer-to-peer -peer learning. And this one encourages each other as opportunity for scaling up. During pre-service and also in service, some teachers might not get some skills right or rather they might forget. But anytime they have peer-to-peer -peer learning, it ensures that they scale up the knowledge that they had. And this is one of the best approaches whereby teachers from a certain school can interact with that, another teacher from a certain school whereby they can share knowledge and after that they can either attend seminars or rather attend like conferences with other teachers from a different region first to ensure they learn and this ensures cultures is there, there is exchange of culture and also exchange of knowledge and this advances the ESD integration into the, into the curriculum. Then, in conclusion, I like to say teacher education institutions can support this process by building ESD awareness and implementation of this. And what we are trying to do, however, in Kenya, we introduce the competency based curriculum. A lot of resources, or rather, a lot of teacher training need to be done because you find it is in its piloting, piloting stage, and we have a lot of like challenges in, in issues to do with resource, issues to do with accreditation. So we believe if teacher education institution, both for pre-service and in-service are strengthened mm -hmm. and also a set curriculum, uniform curriculum for the teachers will ensure the uh, education for sustainable development is, is broad and also it's uniform in all, in all institutions. And in the final slide, I'll show you, this is a picture of one teacher. This was during another tree planting in a certain school in Kenya. And you find the teacher is the one leading, leading in tree growing. We, are, we had already done the mobilization and training, and they later did the tree growing the teacher. And this is a motivation which, which shows us if teachers are well trained and given skills and knowledge, they can really be agents of change even without a certain like a trainer or supervision because after we trained them they later did a tree planting and they did it well and even with the the, play, the schools that we visited we've seen positive impacts whereby teachers have now taken the initiative to lead in in making changes and also coming up with projects that they really supervise this is based because they already got the skills and also the knowledge that we shared. Then thank you for listening and have a great day. Thank you very much. And yes, teachers do have the necessary skill sets to implement ESD to aid their students. And I shall now invite Angelina Davidova, environmental journalist. And Angelina, based on your work, how important do you think factor nine, which is local, culturally relevant, place-based learning, and factor 12, connecting ESD to 21st century skills, jobs, and a sustainable economy relates to the current education framework? Um, thank you for this question, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this panel. Um, besides being an environmental journalist, I also work a lot with various NGOs across Russia and I also contribute to international cooperation between Russian NGOs and NGOs in Germany and other countries, also in the programs and areas of education for sustainable development. And um, I'm strongly convinced that factor nine, which you mentioned already, which is local, culturally relevant, place-based learning, um, is crucial for a successful program. Uh, because everything from culture to expertise of local experts or values to local drivers, they can be different in different
different contexts. And it's super important also when we take um, international programs and international solutions or programs developed elsewhere to adapt them to the local context or maybe even create new products and new programs which are based on the local uh, the context and which involve local actors and local drivers. I will probably bring examples of two such programs, also the ones where I participated in. One of these programs was done by WWF Russia in cooperation with the Russian environmental organization called ECA. And I was also deeply involved in that. Um, I was one of the speakers and lecturers in this program. So what we created was a so-called video construction, constructor for climate education. So we made a series of um, lectures for various ages, uh, for school institutions, after school education, preschool education, um, uh, supplementary school programs on climate change. And uh, we made these lectures in a way that actually educational institutions or teachers or NGO workers who go into schools and are trying to teach children about climate change, they can actually take blocks of this and then integrate them into their curriculum. So it's a very easy program and it's a very easy software where you can actually combine lectures and take the ones you need and also take the infographics you need, take the video graphics you need. So in a way, you don't take a course as a whole, but you choose something what you need. And um, maybe also to add something to this, uh, many schools in Russia still lack education in uh, sustainable development. It's not part of the school curriculum. Likewise, education on climate change issues. And this is why uh, a lot of such programs is being done by NGOs in offline or online format, which is obviously has become much more important in the last year. Another example, which I want, wanted to bring in um, with regard to factor nine, um, is actually something recent. It's a German-Russian uh, cooperation project between um, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and the Leningrad region, which is a region around St. Petersburg. And that region involved uh, 30 to 40 young students, like school children, uh, who were doing at the same time, simultaneously research in Russia and in Germany on the coast of the Baltic Sea about plastic waste on the uh, Baltic Sea coast and microplastic pollution. And uh, they was doing this research at the same time. They were comparing results of their research. Uh, they were communicating a lot with each other. And they also made very wonderful and uh, amazingly sweet movies and videos about this project. Unfortunately, there's not much time to show you the results of this project, but it's still something which uh, stayed deeply in my heart and which I believe through such projects, which also have an international component, yet they're trying to adapt even the most developed and the most profound international methodology to local context, be it German context or Russian context, still united by the Baltic Sea. Uh, it's obviously something uh, which proved to be a very useful program, a very productive cooperation pattern, something where both children and their teachers learned a lot also from each other. And now just a few words to factor 12, because I believe we're running out of time. And uh, so contribution of education for sustainable development for 21st century skills, jobs and sustainable economy. Uh, here, I believe that one of the main approach to education these days, life learning, lifelong learning, and also uh, approaches which are trying to not to give you a set uh, a set of skills, like a set of fixed skills, but instead are trying to um, encourage young people to be adaptive, to be curious, to be uh, decisive, to be proactive. This is obviously something which helps us create not only um, a new economy, but also a new perception of the world. Like how can we function in this new world, which requires us to make decisions which are also adaptive, which are also resilient, and which are also flexible. And um, I believe many of these programs, also the ones which I mentioned before, especially the ones which have a multi-stakeholder character, like the one which was also mentioned in the earlier factors, obviously allows uh, various actors to learn from each other and uh, see what is it that am I doing right? What is it that am I doing wrong? How I can correct maybe what I'm doing and what I've always been doing. And I believe this flexibility and uh, this more um, 
adaptive uh, learning patterns, but also patterns, decision-making patterns, uh, will be highly required in the new economy, also in the new sustainable economy. When we see the world change a lot over the new, over the last few years and dozens of years, also because of climate change, and we'll have to be adaptive and we'll have to change our decisions and we'll have to plan for the future uh, with this future might be uncertain. And it's also something where I believe many of these programs um, actually teach young people, talk to each other, listen to opinions of others and uh, move forward, not by winning or not by proving that you are right, but actually working on a single challenge and trying to come to a single solution, uh, which can be for the benefit of everyone. So I strongly believe that many of the aspects which are integrated into educational for sustainable development programs, and as we heard from previous speakers, there are so many formats of these programs worldwide, uh, culture-wide. So we have and we can learn a lot from each other and also through this program in order to build a new sustainable, resilient world, uh, the world we all want to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelina, and yes, uh... ESD is critical and it will definitely help us to build that resilient and sustainable world. So thank you once again. And the final question I would like to ask to all of our panelists is what are your demands to implement ESD by 2030? So Ralph, let's begin with you. Yeah, our master plan ESD 2030 is uh, has already uh, the number in its title. So until 2030, we want to implement ESD in all educational sectors in Hamburg. So we want to go to the ESD sky in Hamburg in 2000, until 2030. Amazing, thank you, Ralph. Patricia? Uh, by 2030, I would like to demand our leaders to put key consideration in teacher training services and also create a platform where learners both in primary and higher learning get these 21st century skills. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Patricia and Angelina. Um, I would say on my side, um, I would really love to see more school integrated uh, ESD programs also more flexible and um, adaptive ESD programs, but also more in international ESD programs, the ones which imply uh, cooperation and interaction between students from various countries. Absolutely, completely agree with that. And I would definitely say that uh, you know, ESD must be made a mandatory part of the school curriculum in all countries. For it to be effective, resources have to be invested in transformative learning, training environments so that teachers have the requisite skill sets. Virtual learning is here to stay and we must invest to uh, have the resources in place, especially in the developing world, for suitable digital infrastructure that can be used for imparting ESD. So we have run out of time. So with that, this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Let us just remember that the SDGs are not silo-based goals. They're interlinked. They must be implemented within the context of local multidimensionality for them to be truly effective. And education for sustainable development is the tool for driving this transformative change, for influencing behaviors and values that simultaneously ensure environmental protection and conservation, achieving social equity, and accelerating economic sustainability. So on behalf of the World Future Council, thank you so much to all our panelists and to our audience for being with us today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.